eventually take over, really. They will become dominant as what we do medically. We're going to be able to send nanobots, blood cell size devices, inside our bloodstream. They'll keep us healthy from inside and they'll go inside our brains. And if that sounds very futuristic, there are already people that have computers in their brains. Kurzweil believes eventually technology will be advanced enough for us to upload our consciousness to a mainframe computer where unlimited possibilities await. In some ways, the transhumanist movement is its own worst enemy because it often alienates itself from the general public by sounding too radical. I think that the best way to get the future to happen sooner is to communicate to people that this is not scary, this is simply a continuation of the technological progress that we've seen in the past. The picture that we're painting for you about technology is not a pretty one. Many feel that technology will advance, and there's not much anyone can do to prevent that, so what's the point? But is this really the world we want to live in? Forget the Unabomber's vision of returning to a hunter-gatherer society. Is there another way? In part three of this report, we'll shift our focus from threats posed by an out-of-control technological paradigm to real advances that we can use right now that will improve all of our lives without the possibility of wiping out humanity. I began to get into iodine a few years ago because it was helping me and my family so much get healthy and detoxify. I believe our research is conclusive. This is the best iodine out there. And I know this for a fact, nobody else has got iodine based on these pure crystals, ladies and gentlemen. For a limited time, experience the ancient power of Survival Shield X2. I believe our research is conclusive. This is the best iodine out there. Take advantage of this at InfoWarsLife.com. And why wearing a Hillary for President t-shirt might get you punched in the face. They thought it said Hillary for President. He said, I was seconds away from sending my bar back over here to, to punch you in the face. Since you're wearing a Hillary for Prison shirt, you don't have to buy drinks here. Everything's on the house. Hillary for President! Hillary's not surging, I tell you that. They're not saying that. They're not saying that. Thank you. have a Donald Trump endorses Hillary for prison. Get your Hillary for prison 2016 t-shirt at the InfoWars store. And on the back, it says legalize freedom. Show your disapproval of Hillary by buying your t-shirt today. But what she's done is criminal. This is an American president. Just add puppet, then vote and repeat every four years. For the past five years, a fire has been smoldering beneath a landfill in a densely populated suburb of St. Louis. Now, that's not really that unusual. What makes it unusual is that it is less than a quarter of a mile from a large deposit of nuclear waste with no barrier in its way. The residents there were surprised to find out this material was even there in the first place. The EPA is like, don't worry, you might just get a little radon dust which radon is the leading cause of lung cancer, and of course it increases your chances of bone, liver, and breast cancer. Now, my guest today is Dawn Chapman. She is a resident and activist. She's been leading the charge to raise awareness of this uh, with JustMomsSTL.com and STLRadWaste.com. So Dawn, thank you so much for joining me. I see sitting next to you is Scott Kahneman. Uh, Scott, actually your grandfather was the foreman working with Mallinckrodt, which is of course the company who was responsible for dumping uh, this nuclear waste there in the first place under the cloak of uh, national security secrecy there in the suburbs. So we'll get to you in just a minute. But, but Dawn, so what really prompted you to get involved? What was the first thing that you sort of learned what was happening at the Westlake landfill? 
Um, in the matter of a couple of hours after speaking with the state agency, I learned that there was a fire burning in a landfill and that the landfill was a super fun site. And, you know, the agency was telling me, oh, this is really complicated. This is really serious. And then they said, well, you haven't heard anything yet, you know, next to that landfill adjacent, but directly in, co you know, in contact with the landfill is nuclear weapons waste. And I had no idea that St. Louis even played the role that it did in the Manhattan Project that we processed uranium for uh, the bombs that were dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. So my little world was shattered. This whole secrecy thing just really caught me off guard. And really, I felt betrayed because I thought, how in the world was I allowed to buy a house next to this site? And nobody had to tell me about any of this. You know, if, if my house would have had lead paint, somebody would have had to have let me know that that would have had to have been disclosed, but it turns out you can buy a house next to a super fun site and next to the world's oldest nuclear weapons waste in the world. And your government, nobody has to tell you anything. Nobody has to say anything to you. Wow. And so you only learned about this in 2013 when you called state officials to complain about the smell. And I reported that the smell was so bad. I guess the attorney general there was actually suing the company uh, responsible for this site. And that was how you learned about it and just baffled, I guess. I am too. My neighbors had no idea either, you know, and it just, it, it is such, the, the Manhattan Project, even now in St. Louis, is so secretive. And I think that's how it's been allowed to get everywhere. You know, it's been allowed to leak into creeks and sit on landfills for 42 years. I mean, we're starting to see the legacy of that. We're starting to see the effects come out in our kids and in our loved ones. And, you know, there are people coming forward that are in the groups right now. You know, some of us live here, some don't. Some, like Scott, live here and have a direct contact. Um, you know, he lost his grandfather from the Manhattan Project. It's just we're all linked by this. And it's, it's, it's very surreal. It's a very surreal thing to be linked by. Right, and, and there's actually an, an article from about 2013 uh, talking about St. Louis's nuclear legacy, how it might be more dire than anyone can even imagine, talking about how the children who grew up playing uh, in, in the creek or near the, the Westlake, um, how they are now starting to see the symptoms of playing in these affected areas. People 40 years old are dying from really rare cancers, uh, non-smoking lung cancer, for instance, um, but also autoimmune diseases, birth defects. There's, I guess, more than 2,500 cases of cancer being reported on one of the main pages where they're collating a lot of the data from people who are bringing, bringing their information forward with this. Right, and that's just heartbreaking. You know, the other thing that we're seeing is that Unfortunately, we're seeing little children who never grew up in the area, but are, but are children of the exposed that are coming down with cancers. You know, sometimes it skips a generation and that's heartbreaking. But, um, you know, th these are citizen documented cancers. You know, the citizens are coming forward. But we also had the state of Missouri. Um, they did an overview of the zip codes that appeared to be affected with Manhattan Project waste that were you know, that they can say for certain, yeah, there's little areas where this waste has set out. And the state last fall, 2014, came out with um, their health assessment for the area, and it's not good. I mean, in this area where we sit right now, next to Pattonville High School here, we have a 302% increase in childhood brain cancers and neurological cancers. That is, that is a 302% increase. And, you know, we're a tight community, man. We know those kids. We've done GoFundMes for those children. We've watched them get diagnosed, watched them die. I mean, this is devastating to us. Wow, that is incredible. And, and I went to Pattonville High School, so that is so shocking to me. What do you think about the response from the EPA? Just they're really only speaking about this stuff now because you've been so active in trying to educate and raise awareness of this issue that kind of forcing their hand uh, the officials are squabbling, and the EPA says, we don't agree with the finding that the subsurface smoldering event is approaching this radiologically impacted material. It's fine. Everything is fine. And they just, last week, the schools finally sent out a letter to parents uh, in the case that there was some sort of catastrophic nuclear event. Here's how you can protect yourself. 
How, how do you feel about that response? I'm very angry at the EPA right now. Um, super fun. This is a super fun site. So we're talking about the super fun program with an EPA. The way that works is the owner of the site. So the one that caused the mess gets to use their own scientists and has them write up reports, has them collect data. And then once those reports are written, then they're handed over to EPA. So this is an EPA science. This is science given to the Environmental Protection Agency from the company responsible for the fire who is currently also being sued by the attorney general. And this is EPA looking over that data and rubber stamping it. Wow. This isn't an independent set of eyes. You know, if I hit your car, there's no way you're going to let me take your car to my mechanic. That's just not how it works. And unfortunately, in this situation and with this federal agency, that's what's being allowed to happen in this community. Incredible. And now, Scott, how do you fit into this story? Obviously, I know this is affecting you as a resident there, uh, but talk to me a little bit more. I mean, this is really shocking to you, I guess. Yeah. So uh, as you mentioned earlier, my grandfather was the foreman at Mallinckrodt Chemical Works. Uh, and, um, you know, he was there through the Manhattan Project and up through the Cold War. And safety standards were different in those decades, almost non-existent. Uh, the story of the way these employees were intentionally and, and, and knowingly exposed by management to these toxic and radioactive substances is, uh, it would probably put the Tuskegee experiment to shame if it ever actually came out. Uh, it's just that dire of intentional human experimentation. My grandfather, notwithstanding, uh, he was the foreman there. Uh, there was radioactive dust circulating and toxic dust circulating all around these facilities. And, you know, he'd go in and out of there and he'd have the dust on his hands thinking there's, you know, it's no big deal. It's, it's just like if you're a mechanic, you have grease on your hands. You know, it was just something that happened because of your job. Well, he'd come home with the dust on his hands and he'd hug his wife and play with his kids. Uh, and then, you know, uh, radiological illness struck and um, he ended up dying uh, with a radiologically induced lung cancer. Uh, and, you know, he, we found out he was exposed to beryllium, uranium, plutonium. Uh, I mean, you know, all the daughter products of uranium uh, it, that happened during the processing. He was exposed to it all. So were all of his co-workers. Right. And this led the U.S. government to pass a piece of legislation called the EEOICPA. Uh, and um, I believe it was EOICPA 2001 or 2002. We, we call it EOICPA. And, and Sorry, that's an acronym, but it's the EEO ICPA, and it provides uh, government compensation for survivors of Manhattan Project experimentation. Mm. And, and how, how strange is that? Uh, so my family went through that EOICPA process, and they put, you know, the, this paperwork was intense, and they had to dose reconstruct his circumstances on records that aren't, don't even exist anymore. Right. You can't, I, you, I, the I records mean, don't even exist anymore. Yeah, absolutely. And that's one of the big issues that people have with these cases. You know, they're from decades ago. And so that's I can't wait to get get to St. Louis and speak with you all in depth. Do it a really great interview uh, with you guys, with a, a lot of other family members there as well. Like you said, they had no idea that they were even transporting this material and then going home to their families. So thank you all so much. Um, and we'll be seeing you next week. That's it for the show tonight. We'll see you here tomorrow, 7 p.m. Central. Knockout is back. If you want a product that has 10 known ingredients that naturally get your body to relax, your brain to relax, so you get deep, restful sleep, knockout's it. Infowarslife.com. L-theanine, hops flower extract, lemon balm extract, valerian root extract, chamomile flower extract, L-tryptophan extract, melatonin, and more. All organic, all the natural sources. It's the same price as leading brands of melatonin that are three milligrams a piece. It has three milligram, the standard recommended dose for an adult. It's got the GABA. So it would probably cost $50 to take all this as separate pills. It's $19.95. You take one or two of these and it just is really clean restful sleep is what the reviews are. It's what I've experienced. 
and it just synergistically puts everything in there. InfoWarsLife.com. That's InfoWarsLife.com. Or call 888-253-3139. You are watching the InfoWars Nightly News, which airs 7 p.m. Central at InfoWarsNews.com. And your support is helping us defend liberty worldwide.